Hey guys, this is John, and I'm excited to introduce to you my very first chess opponent. So without any further ado, there you have it. The Excalibur Explorer Deluxe Electronic Chess Game. Okay, so I kind of lied. My very first chess opponent was actually a friend of mine named Aaron. Aaron and I were buddies in second grade, and he taught me the game. But unfortunately, I don't keep in touch with Aaron anymore. Uh, Aaron, if you happen to watch this, thank you for introducing me to chess. You changed my life forever. But this guy right here, this tabletop chess program, was the thing I credit with giving me the most improvement in chess. Like, not kidding. Like, of all the coaches that I've had, uh, of all the players I've admired and whose games I've studied, um, of all of the online resources I've utilized, like, everything pales in comparison to this thing. So, I thought it'd be kind of cool to take a look back at this and show you what a tabletop chess computer is, for one thing, because I bet there's many people who've never even seen or used one of these things, and maybe even give it a go, um, because it's been probably over 15 years since I've taken a serious look at this thing. It's just been kind of like those score sheets I was telling you guys about in a recent video, just collecting dust in my closet. Um, I did take this out to make sure that uh, the batteries were fresh. Um, <laughs> they were dead after many years, as you might expect. So I put some fresh batteries in this, but otherwise I haven't explored it in probably 15 plus years. So let's go ahead and take a look. So this is the Ex Excalibur Explorer Deluxe Electronic Chess Game. It has 72 levels, and it boasts some of the teaching options it has as well. And, yeah, special rating functions. It supposedly monitors your level of play. You can save your games, and it keeps track of how you've been doing. Uh, and it's got this LCD display, which you can see in the picture here, which I'll show you once we pull this out. Let's take a look at the back. It has a little synopsis. What is a chess computer? <laughs> So I probably had this thing like circa 1995 or 96 when I got it. And that was right around the time that Deep Blue beat Kasparov. So it's not like chess computers were unknown, but probably to the public, it was still like a fairly new thing. This talks about some of the features down here. We got the Staunton style pieces, the take back function. And this is probably the most interesting thing. So the estimated rating of this program, which I think is the top rating, is 1650. So it has 72 levels. And the highest level is 1650. And I find that kind of surprising because I remember thinking like how tough this program was. It's probably just one of those things, you know, when you're like getting into a game and players who are low level, uh, when you think of them nowadays, now that you're more proficient in whatever game it is, you were thinking back then were like gods, you know, like probably I thought a 1650 was like an incredible player. And don't get me wrong, 1650 is still a decent amateur rating. Uh, but when you think about the fact that today's programs like Komodo and Stockfish are well over 3,000 in estimated rating, like that puts things in perspectives. <laughs> uh, perspective. So it has coaching functions, hundreds of pre-programmed book opening moves. So yeah, it, it does play some standard openings. I do recall that. I don't ever recall solving mate problems or setting up a particular position. I don't think I used that that much. Here again, it talks about the teaching mode. Again, I don't think I ever explored that. I pretty much just use this as an opponent, and that's about it. So let's open this baby up. This feels like one of those unboxing videos, right? Like, I'm going to throw a loot crate video at you guys like all the other YouTubers do. <laughs> okay, so this is it. Uh, let's get it out of the styrofoam. Styrofoam, first of all. Oh, man, how am I going to do this without spilling pieces? All right, there we go. And let me adjust my video just a little bit. So this is what it looks like. It's a pretty simple device. It's a tabletop chess computer. You've got the wood grain. You've got all the buttons on the side. And the LCD display is where everything is really run from. The, the computer actually displays the moves that it wants to play up here. And you have to play the moves manually for the computer. And this sort of touchscreen thing is still what works today, albeit in a much more sophisticated way. So when you see like top level chess broadcasts uh, featuring, you know, many games from a tournament, they often use these LCD boards and the modern boards can actually track like which pieces are on which squares. This one doesn't have that ability. Like you could put a black bishop on E7 and it would think it's a, a black pawn because that's where a black pawn starts at the beginning of the game. 
So this program doesn't have that function, but it works well enough. So let's get this thing set up and play around with it a little bit. These pieces, they're pretty basic. They're just plastic pieces with little magnets on the bottom. So the board is magnetized and they stick right to it. I just think back of like the countless hundreds of hours I spent playing this thing. Like seriously guys, uh, it was my first serious chess opponent and I took full advantage of this program. Um, I started at level one and worked my way up to level 72 and I beat all of the levels in order. And I remember getting stuck on certain levels at times. It was never like a, a walk in the park to progress. And this was all before I started playing tournaments, really, which makes me wonder how I managed to beat level 72 without using like the, wherever it is, the take back button. <laughs> you can take back moves and play better stuff if you like, but I never cheated like that. So I probably managed to beat level 72 just purely by, by luck at a certain time. But boy, I tell you, like sitting down and playing a program like this, again, even though it's pretty basic by today's standards. It did instill a lot of over the board discipline. It might even be a useful training method if you plan to play a tournament. If you're one of these players who as of now just plays like exclusively online, but you think you might want to play a tournament someday, maybe a tabletop chess computer is not a bad investment for you because just getting used to physically moving the pieces and playing without any distractions. You know how when you're playing online, your phone might go off or you might get a notific like a Facebook notification or something. If you just kind of go in a room, put the tabletop chess computer on and just immerse yourself in the game, it's very much like you're playing a human OTB opponent. So let's turn this on. I did pull this thing out just to make sure that it had some fresh batteries. I had to replace the batteries, but otherwise I really haven't looked at this thing forever. Uh, so the display up here is where everything is run. Let's go to the level function. I'm going to set it to a lower level because I do remember about the higher levels. The program often thinks for a very long time trying to find the best move. Its circuitry is going and, you know, whatever basic engine is being run in here uh, really works hard when you get up to the higher levels. So let's just put it on a, a lower level for fun. Oh, there's actually a level zero. So I probably started with level zero and worked my way up. Let's do like level 10 or something. I don't know. You got to scroll through manually. You can't enter in one zero to get to level 10. Uh, okay, let's do that. White, black. I'll, I'll be white. Sorry, computer. I know I'm like, you know, 24, 2500, and I'm taking the white pieces here in 2016, but you're just going to have to deal with it. And let's see if we can start this thing. Okay, so let's open with E4. So what you got to do is you got to press down. Oh, is that going to work? New game. Press down, E2, and press down again to show where you went. E4. Uh, that didn't like that. It's giving me an error message. E2. Hmm. Move. E2. Oh, now it wants to play white. No, 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 no. All right, you want to play white computer? I want to be white. New game, new game. Uh, hmm. <laughs> oh, the trials and tribulations of older technology, right? Hmm. Oh, it won't let me do anything until I make this move. Oh, actually, no, no, no never mind. Okay. E4, E5? What does that mean? That can't possibly be the right thing. Oh, uh, computer, I think you had something to drink. We're going to turn this off. E4, E5. I'm pretty sure this thing still works, so let's, let's get a new game going. This would be so disappointing if it didn't. E2. Hallelujah. Okay, game in progress. Let's do this thing, guys. So the computer wants to play C7, C6, the Karo Khan defense. Level 10 is opening with the Karo Khan. All right, well, this should be fun. 
Uh, let's play the, let's play them. Actually, you know what? I'm going to play that apocalypse variation that I mentioned in my previous video. <laughs> I swear this was not planned, uh, but I did a video featuring international master Levon Altunian's repertoire for Chessable. And I talked about this apocalypse variation that he recommended in there. Go check out the previous video I posted. So let's see how level 10 of Excalibur, the tabletop chess computer reacts to that. So our idea is to take the pawn on d5. And then after it takes back, I'm gonna throw my knight into the e5 square. Oh, but it messes with my plans. Ah, maybe, maybe Excalibur is a Scandinavian player at heart. It's moving its queen out. Queen takes d5. Well, that is very interesting, sir. So kind of a delayed version of the Scandinavian. Well, let's play, let's play d4. I'm not gonna put my knight on c3 yet, even though that would be like a standard thing to do. I'm just gonna wait and then try to get my pawn up to c4. I'm gonna try to do that so I can gain a lot of space in the center. D5, no, that can't possibly be right. D5, F5, okay. It says move the queen over here. So the, the computer is breaking one of the cardinal rules of the opening, which says you shouldn't move the same piece too many times. You know, in the Scandi, you break that rule. But I don't like that move because the engine is just moving the piece over there for no particular reason. So what can I do? I can play a developing move with a gain of time. Bring my bishop out and attack that queen. Show me what you got, comp. Uh, F5, G4, okay. Well, the computer's not hanging its queen, that's a good sign. They are attacking my pawn down on G2. I think this is a good moment, just a castle. And then I gotta play this over here. Yeah, this press down and then press down again thing to do the uh, destination square is a little awkward at first, but you quickly get used to it. B8 to A6. So now it develops a piece. I think I want to harass this queen. I think I'd like to go attack it. I'm going to play H2, H3. Move the pawn up. Attack the queen. See what you think about that. I mean, I could take the knight on a6, but I don't see a particular reason to at the moment, so why force things? g4, h5. All right. Not bad so far, computer. Let's just bring a piece out. I mentioned bringing the pawn up here, but I think given that they've wasted a lot of time with their queen, I think simple development is in order. I mean, they might actually not have a that bad of a position here, but let's see the next move. That's e7, e6. Okay. So what's the drawback of that move? Well, it traps in that bishop on c8. Yeah, that bishop is going to have a hard time getting out. Now, I'm looking at ways to try to ensnare that black queen. But if I play g4, I am going to lose the pawn on h3. So I don't want to do that. I'm thinking about just making another developing move. Let's just play, let's play rook over to e1. And line up that rook with the black king on e8. There we go. So we get some nice x-ray ideas down the file. And the computer is developing. All right, g8, f6, brings the knight out. Good move, I think. I'd really like to bust this position open and play pawn d5, but it doesn't work tactically yet. I can't do it. Hmm. I'm just going to bring my bishop into the game. Let's play bishop from c1 to f4. Bring the pieces out. All right, c8, d7. Okay, so is black thinking about castling queenside? I would probably welcome them castling queenside because then I very well might take that knight on a6 and just wreck their position. So what can I kind of do to coax the computer to castle that way? Well, I think what I can do actually is maybe just take the knight and then play queen e2. That looks sensible. Yeah, you know what? I am going to take the knight now. Because now that that bishop on c8 is no longer guarding the a6 pawn, or the pawn that will land on a6 once I've captured, I think that's a nice little, a juicy target. And the computer is taking the bishop. Now let's play the intended move. I could also play queen d3. Queen d3 or queen e2. Maybe queen d3 is better, because that way 
I don't block my rook down the e-file. Yeah, the queen might have some more flexibility here. And also now I can maybe move my knight to the e5 square. That's kind of tempting as well. And the engine responds right away. Swing the queen over to a5, guarding the pawn. That's a good move. Good move, computer. All right, so do I play knight e5, or do I somehow try to take advantage of the queen over here? I'm sort of looking at that as well, like maybe a move like a3, intending b4. But nah, I'm going to jump this knight in. Let's get that knight working towards the center. Put pressure on the f-pawn. I think black has to castle pretty soon, if they know what's good for them. So I would recommend that they do that. a5 to b6. So the computer has made an awful lot of queen moves. How many queen moves has the computer made? Queen to d5, queen to f5, queen to g4. Yeah, that's three. Uh, h5 is four, a5 is five, b6 is six. So six queen moves already in the first, like, ten moves or so. Hmm. So I was thinking maybe knight c4, trying to hit the queen and also work into the d6 square. But my spidey sense is tingling. I'm, I really want to play that d5 move. Like, I feel like d5 could just collapse their position real quick. All right, I'm going to be ruthless. Sorry, level 10 Excalibur. I'm going for the throat here. I mean, I have a lot of nostalgic feelings towards you, a lot of positive nostalgic feelings, but I still want to crush you. F8, C5. Good move, computer. Good move. Attacking the pawn on F2. I definitely do not mind that decision by them. I saw that move, but I thought I could play knight a4. I didn't quite realize that I have this pawn on f2 to worry about. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So do I take on d7? Yeah, I think taking d7 is probably good. I don't think they really have time to take on f2. I mean, they could try. But I'm taking on e6 pretty fast. Yeah, let's do that. Take that bishop. See if they want to go ahead and take f2. The thing is, if they take f2 and then try to take my rook, I take their queen on b6. So that's not going to work out so well for them. Yeah, and the computer, I think, correctly decides to... Wait. Oh, never mind. The computer probably incorrectly decides to take with the king. It's telling me e8 takes d7. Risky, risky. Don't know about that one. All right. Because... Now black can't castle, and also they're walking right into the line of fire with my queen on d3. So I guess the question is which way to take. Do I take c6 check or e6 check? Probably e6 check, right? Because that pawn is even protected by the rook. If take on c6, I think they could play king takes, and yeah, it's still pretty bad for them, but it's not losing right away. I guess I have a check on f3, but now nah, e6 has got to be just the, the natural and strong move here, right? Well, I don't know, actually. I mean, both ways are pretty darn tempting. Now, I'm going to take with the e-pawn. Uh, take the e-pawn, I should say. So, d5 takes e6. d7, e7, running away. So, now I can take another pawn with check, which I probably should. Yeah, let's do that. So, discovery. Take that pawn out. Hmm. F7 takes E7. Now, I can't check down on D7. I'd like to keep my attack going. I can't check on D7 because black does have that knight on F6. But I can deliver a check on C4, which I'm thinking about doing. Don't see any other great moves, so yeah, let's do that one. At some point, I probably will have to address this pawn on F2, which is hanging with check, but I hope that isn't uh, a huge problem. I don't think it will be. F7 to G6, wow. Out into the great wide open. Hmm. So I could give another check on d3, but the move I'd like to play is knight a4. Knight a4, forking the queen and the bishop. But knight a4, bishop takes f2. What then? They escape that with check. I think it's maybe best just to play like a move like bishop e3, looking for a trade so my rook can come up to e3. And then maybe swing over to the g3 square even. So I'm going to pause my attack for a moment. Just take one move to consolidate my position. So bring the bishop back here. Let's see what the engine does. Yeah, c5 takes e3. And 
now I get to further my attack and recapture a piece. So let's do this. Rook takes e3. I got a feeling that that king is getting weaker by the move. Probably he needs to think about something like pawn to h6 so the king can escape. Instead, h8 to f8. So rook to f8. Uh, wait, what? Oh, e8. I'm sorry. So the computer is centralizing. But I have no interest in trading rooks. I'm going to use this rook for my attack. Now I can deliver that check on g3. And that king is going to have to run somewhere where it's going to be even more naked, I think. So yeah, we'll, we'll go check there. g6, h6. They could play king f5, but yeah, moving the king to h6, I believe is going to result in a mate in two. And if you want to pause your video and figure that out, you can do so now. So white to move, checkmate in two moves. I think there's a couple checkmate in twos, actually. So I can play queen f4 check or queen h4. Either way, my queen is going to land on the g5 square next. So let's play queen f4. And it responds right away. Only two moves in the position. Black could also play g5, but it will be met with the same fate. So now, f4 to g5, queen to g5, checkmate. And we have defeated level 10. Did it give us a congratulations message? Nope, it just says 10. <laughs> level 10 defeated. Uh, okay, well, I think black actually recovered from that opening fairly well, but too many queen moves. Like I said, queen d5 to f5 to g4 to h5 to a5 to b6, neglecting black's development. Maybe there was some way that black could have got out of that mess, but they needed to get their dark square bishop into the game sooner and ideally try to castle. Things really fell apart for black when uh, Excalibur played the capture on d7 with the king. I mean, I think knight takes d7 wasn't going to be much better, but at least that way black could entertain the idea of castling short still. Okay, that was a lot of fun. I really like that. So thank you guys for checking out this video featuring my first serious chess opponent. Thank you to Excalibur. Uh, I don't know anyone at Excalibur, but thank you for making this program. Um, this is just one of the benefits of living in the information age. And I know there's lots of people who have gotten better by means of computers in chess. I mean, that's why we see so many strong players these days. There's just a tremendous amount of resources out there that people can take advantage of. And even back in 1995, 96, I was doing that myself. So let me know if you have any questions about this program or this game in the CaroCon. And also, what was your first chess opponent? I'm curious what you guys have to say. Like, did you play against a human first? Did you learn from some tutorial online and you started playing online opponents? Was it a computer? Let me know in the comments. And also thank you for any likes and shares and subscriptions. Always appreciate that. All right, guys. Talk to you later. Bye.